and all Nathrak, Unsfal Vethar, and all the Ende. And all Nathrak, Unsfal Vethar, and all the Ende. Whoa, put on some clothes. I'm wearing clothes. Oh. What are you doing? I'm trying to do the Vince Ventrilla wet blending tutorial, but I don't think I'm getting the incantation right. Oh, I see your problem. Uh, your Agrax Earthshade is not facing west. I'm Shu. <laughs> I'm Dylan. And we're talking about malign sorcery today. Should you pick it up? Shouldn't you pick it up? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What is this thing? First and foremost, these are the miniatures you get in the Malign Sorcery um, Kit. They are excellent quality, high detail plastic miniatures. Uh, they're pretty big as well. I'm going to show you a, uh, another miniature for scale. In the background we have some terrain, ignore that stuff. What you're seeing with, with the, anything with the base here is, is what actually comes in the set itself. They so, don't come painted like this, by the way. No, none of these miniatures are provided painted, just like normal Games Workshop miniatures. But here's a... Um, Here's a future Blight King up in the front here. It's a pretty big model, and so you kind of get the sense of scale. These are all really big. Here's a section for Clan Scryer, the uh, army with the Scryer keyword from the General's Handbook 2018. The reason why I'm pointing this out is so you can see that there's all kinds of special rules that come with an army that's been developed after 2015 when Age of Sigmar first came out. They have artifacts of power and special command traits, and that's nice, but armies that were put out before then don't really have access to all this cool stuff. This is the Allegiance Abilities page for Chaos, the Grand Alliance Chaos. Similar to the Clan Scryer page you saw that we have, uh, you see that we have command traits here and we have some artifacts of Chaos that are kind of genericized and uh, not really flavorful based on the army you might be playing. That happens to be exactly my situation for this, uh, my favorite army to play, which happens to be the Warherd. Uh, part of the Beastmen army originally has been split off into its own faction. Now while they don't have their own wizards, I've allied in a little Bray Shaman. So that gives me access to spells, but to what end? Enter Malign Sorcery. One of the best things you'll find in Malign Sorcery is a artifact of power for the realm that your army is themed after, and also relics for the realm that your army is themed after. So on the left-hand column here, if you're army is from Akshi, you can pick from basically magic weapons, and over here you can pick from these magic items. Now the thing that makes that really awesome is that if you paint your army to a specific theme, like I have here with these little uh, like maze bases here, then I can say this is uh, an army from a specific or realm. Give them the artifacts from the realm that I've chosen. In addition to the relics and artifacts, you also have spells of the realms, where basically you've chosen where, to, where your battle is going to take place. So every wizard on the table knows the spells of this realm in addition to the normal spells they already have. Uh, so for this example, in, in Giran, wizards know the spell Briarstorm, which allows them to summon hail of sharpened thorns from above to saturate an area. Then this back is... over to the General's Handbook 2018, you can actually see that there's a points cost for match play for each of the endless spells that come in the uh, uh, My Line Sorcery box. That allows you to purchase a spell and then include it in your army as something that your wizard has brought as a special kind of ace in the hole for what they're going to try to achieve. Now let's go over the actual tactics for each spell one at a time. First up, the endless spell, the burning head. The burning head needs to be set up with wholly within three inches of the caster. The burning head moves nine inches the turn it is summoned and can fly. In this case, Dylan has moved it over the Doombo model here, I got in contact with the Gorgon there. So he's going to do D3 mortal wounds to each target that it moves across. In addition, reroll hit rolls of 1 for attacks made by units that are wholly within 9 inches of this model. That means that this is a buff that you can actively place near your own troops if you want to. Most endless spells are static, but in the case of some endless spells that do move, they are considered predatory endless spells. That means that they get to be moved electively by the player who goes second in each battle round. Now, the player who goes second in, in any battle round can choose when the predatory and the spell is moved, but if there are more than one predatory and the spells on the board, then players alternate. So specifically the rule reads as such. Predatory and the spells are moved at the start of each battle round. 
after the players determine who will have the first turn, but before the turn begins. Players alternate picking predatory and the spells to move, starting with the player who has the second turn. So in this case, Dylan cast this spell at the end of the first battle round, and I lost the roll-off. He's chosen to go first. That gives me an opportunity to now move this endless spell. I can turn it right around and put it within an inch of his wizard. Take that, wizard. Tides have turned. Next up, we have the predatory spell, the Malevolent Maelstrom. The cool thing about this model is that it can appear within 18 inches of the caster instead of wholly within 3, and it can move up to 8 inches and still flies. But in this case, what happens is when a... As a, like a special rule, when there's a wizard casting a spell within 12 inches of this model, uh, and that spell is not unbound, then the Malevolent Maelstrom will attempt to steal the energy of the spell. So you make an additional unbinding roll for that spell, and if the unbinding roll is successful, then the spell is unbound, and the energy an energy point is allocated to this model. At the end of the, each battle round, roll a dice for each Malevolent Maelstrom that has a number of energy, and add the number of energy points allocated to that roll. Model. On a 7+, plus, the Malevolent Maelstrom will explo explode, and that means that each unit within 3 to 6 inches of this model is going to suffer D3 mortal wounds. So this thing is going to roam around the table, soaking up magic spells and making itself more potentially dangerous. And it's not necessarily going to go off when you want it to. So this is a pretty good thing to have on the table if there's a lot of magic going around. It can work you know, to or against you necessarily, depending on whether or not you choose to go first or second. But that makes the dreaded Age of Sigmar double turn, turn dice, way more important and thrilling. Next up, the Geminids of Olgish. The thing that makes this spell really interesting uh, is that when they move around, they have different properties. You see that they're painted differently. You have the... Uh, the Geminid of Shadow and the Geminid of Light. In this case, uh, I painted them Shadow and um, Life. So when the Shadow Geminid model has moved, any unit that is, has models in it that it passes across suffer D3 mortal wounds, and in addition, you subtract one to a minimum of one from the attacks characteristic of melee weapons used by the uh, unit. The Light Geminid has different properties. So when it passes across a unit, it suffers D the unit suffers D3 mortal wounds, in addition, subtract one from the hit rolls for that um, unit. So that means that you can give a new unit effectively minus one to hit and minus one to attack. Next up, we have the Chronomatic Cogs. The Chronomatic Cogs are actually the first of the static endless spells that we've summoned today. And in this case, what it allows you to do is effectively control time. That allows them to speed up time, adding two inches to the move characteristic of all units on the battlefield, including enemies. In addition, add two to the charge rolls for all units on the battlefield, or they can slow down time. The wizard manipulating the cogs can add one additional spell to their hero phase, in addition, reroll failed save rolls for that wizard. So it's a pretty big buff either way if you really want to make the battle super bloody, or if you know you're going up against a really slow opponent, uh, giving them plus two to move might not be so great, but plus two to move for yourself could be really awesome. Uh, you can use this to amplify your situation for better or worse. Next up, the Soul Snare Shackles. This is another uh, example of a static endless spell. When you summon the first Soul Snare Shackle, you have to set it up within tw uh, 12 inches of the wizard that summons it. But this intrepid wizard also has two other Soul Snare Shackle models that get placed within 6 inches of the first one. So, in this case, we'll put that one over here. I'll put the next one on the other side to create a little bit of a barrier uh, over here. What the Soul Snare Shackles will do is at the start of the movement phase, roll a dice for each unit within six inches of the Soul Snare Shackle models. Boop. That would be this poor Bulgore here. On the roll of a 3+, plus, you have the movement characteristic of that unit until the end of the phase. On a 6, the unit also suffers D3 mortal wounds. This is really potent if you're running a gunline army. Next up, we have the Suffocating Grave Tide this big mama gemma right here. The suff suffocated grave tide is a predatory on the spell, so another one that moves. When you summon it, you set it up wholly within four inches of the caster. Now that's kind of tricky because uh, you can actually see that this is a um, pretty large model. It's a pretty big model. So it's almost four inches from edge to edge, and this is pretty much the only configuration in which you can set it up, uh, unless you kind of have it pointed toward your, your own dude. Uh, but that isn't, you know, for cinematic value, that's not as cool. Uh, 
So that's pretty much the only way you can summon the thing. And once you summon it, it can move up to eight inches and then fly. So I'm gonna ram it into these poor Griffhounds here. No. Uh, the Griffhounds are gonna suffer D3 mortal wounds. In addition, I'm gonna subtract one from the bravery characteristic for each unit that has any models in it that have been, that have been passed over by the Grave Tide. So if there was another unit on the way that got passed over, then they would be suffering an additional, um, or they would also be suffering the bravery debuff. Now, the cool thing about this is when a missile weapon that targets a unit that has all of its models within one inch of the Grave Tide, it is considered to be in cover. So while I've just rammed these Griffhounds with a big pile of uh, skulls and, and dirt and other garbage, uh, they're now in cover, so I've buffed them inadvertently. Next up, one of my favorite endless spells is the Aether Void Pendulum. Now, when this thing is cast, you set it up and you face it in a specific direction. This is a predatory endless spell, so it's going to move. It can move up to 8 inches and fly, but it only goes in the direction that it's pointed. Um, it only ever goes in that direction. It has a special rule called Unstoppable Mechanism. Whenever you set up an Aether Void Pendulum, you must place it lengthways in the direction you wish it to move. Whenever it moves, move it in a straight line in that direction, which means your enemy can't turn it around and point it back at you if they get the turn priority or if they don't have the turn priority in the next battle round. Now, how this came to an effect in a game that I was playing is I summoned the Aether Void Pendulum and I sent it toward my friend's unit. In this case, it's going to be Dylan's uh, poor Griffhounds. Uh, but I was just outside of range of, of actually hitting them. In the next turn, uh, he got the turn priority, which allowed him to kind of allowed his wizard effectively to hold the pendulum in place while he moved his griffhounds out of the way. Now, that was a uh, pretty cinematic moment. Uh, I wouldn't have thought of it that way just by reading the War Scroll. If I didn't actually experience this in a game, I would have thought, well, this is kind of a throwaway spell, just a, a missile, just hit someone with these six mortal ones and forget it. But the idea of like this happening from a narrative standpoint is pretty cool. Like the fact that's baked into the mechanics of the War Scroll. Next up is the Emerald Life Swarm. This cool uh, skull vomiting a bunch of bees. After uh, this model's been set up, or if it's moved, pick one unit with one inch of it. In this case, my poor Doom Bull is being overwhelmed, and my Brave Shaman has sent in the Endless Life, Spo Endless Life Swarm to go heal him. Now in this case, if he has been damaged, I can heal him up to D3 mortal wounds, or I'm sorry, up to D3 wounds. Uh, but if there's a unit that I'm healing, I can actually return models to it if I roll if they have a wounds characteristic equal to or less than a D3. So in the case of like Bulgor, who all have four wounds each, I'm not going to be returning any models to that unit because uh, I can't roll over a three with a D3. Next up, we have Ravnox Gnashing Jaws. Now, Big model, so this is a six inch ruler here. It has to be set up within six inches of the caster and can move up to 12 inches and fly. Uh, 12 inches is a pretty big distance considering now, if your battle takes place in the Realm of Beasts, that means that it's empowered by oh. Gur. This model can move up to D6 plus 12 inches instead of just 12 inches. So this thing moves really fast. It still only does D3 damage for any units that it moves over, but it is a, it's a speedy, zippy thing, and it's also a quite large model, so you're able to come in contact with a lot more units that way. Next up, we have the Prismatic so. Palisade, which is kind of a defensive spell that you most likely want to use against uh, range units and things like um, that. But any models that are um, blocked off by the uh, Prismatic Palisade model here, they can't see anything beyond it. So this Bray Shaman, for example, cannot be seen uh, if you draw an imaginary one millimeter line for the model itself. Yeah, so you draw the line from the base of the attacking model to the base of the defending model and uh, to the center of the, the base, and that's how you determine whether or not you have line of sight. Now that line of sight is limitless height, so even if it's the Brave Shaman that's hiding behind the wall, or the impressive Gorgon miniature, like the Gorgon in this case cannot be seen by those handgunners. That's pretty cool. That means that you can have dudes up on top of a building, or someone up in a, an airship, and it's now effectively out of line of sight. From okay, so next up we have the Umbral Spell Portal, which allows you to move uh, other endless predatory spells across the battlefield. Um, how it works is it casts on a 5 and you set up the first one wholly within 12 inches of the caster right here, and then the second one can go 18 inches within uh, the first Umbral Spell Portal. 
So in this case, we're going to put it over here by the Gorgon. All right. If a predatory endless spell finishes move within six inches of the Umbral Spell Portal, uh, remove it from the battlefield and set up a, set it up again within six inches of the other portal. So if this were to end here, we just simply remove it and we can place it six inches within the other portal. All right, so here we have the Quicksilver Swords. And the way the spell itself works is you pick one unit within six inches of it and roll 12 dice. For each unit that's a six up, uh, they suffer one mortal wound, but if the unit is chaos, they suffer m mortal wound on a five plus. It's gonna make the Quicksilver Swords a mainstay in most order armies if they know they're going to be going up a chaos, against a chaos opponent. I personally don't like that because I play chaos. Finally, we have the Purple Sun of Sheish, cast by my unwitting necromancer here. Why is he What this thing does is it's a predatory on the spell. It moves up to nine inches and can fly. And in this case, any model that it moves across, or any unit that moves across, you roll a dice equal to the number of models in that unit. On a six plus, a model in that unit is slain. In this case, the model here that we're going up against, the purple sun is going to go up against this, uh, uh, what is this, the Hurricane? Celestial Hurricane. Celestial Hurricane. Um, because its wounds characteristic is higher than six, uh, and that's the characteristic, mind you, not just how many wounds it has left. Because the wounds characteristic is six or more, it suffers 2d6 mortal wounds instead on a roll of a six. So basically, you'd have to summon it, send it into a big model like this, roll a six, and then you would do 2d6 mortal wounds. That means that the Purple Sun of Shayesh is way more effective against a horde unit, something with lots of models with a low wound count, something like Skaven or uh, Greenskins. Or... The Purple Sun is not necessarily the thing you want to crash into a, a big centerpiece model like this, but hey, you know, if you want to risk if it for the biscuit, lucky, yeah. yeah, if you're feeling lucky, you can set it in there and you might swallow it whole. That's going to be it for our Malign Sorcery review. Thanks for watching. I know it's been really bothersome to hear War Scrolls read to you. Uh, we're just trying to show what makes the Malign Sorcery set cool. We have lots of armies that come from like the 2015 era that haven't necessarily got the attention that they, we feel like they deserve. So this gives you a chance to spice up your old armies that are made up of entirely, uh, you know, 2015 units such as uh, Phoenix Temple or Warherd. I know the Beastmen are going to get battalion soon. Or, what's another good example of 2015 army? Uh, your Devoted to Sigmar is another one. Um, they don't have allegiance abilities, do they? Nope. nope. Gotta use Ample Guard. <laughs> yeah, gotta use Ample Guard. That's the other thing, is that in addition to the endless, or the relics, artifacts, and spells you have in Malign Sorcery, just so much flavor you can add to your um, army. But in my opinion, Malign Sorcery is something that, if you're going to be serious about Age of Sigmar in 2018 and on, you're going to want to get this set for seeing things like the pendulum stop on its face, or seeing somebody send a grave tide back at, a, at its caster. It's all pretty awesome. So, have a look. Um, it's totally worth the money. And thanks for watching.